2.2 is titled Basic Differentiation Rules. Now, what we did in section 2.1 is we looked at the limit definition for three different types, because those are our examples. We did them for radicals, we did them for polynomials, and we did them for rationals. And that's enough to have a feel for what's going on. So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to um, benefit from the people who came before us, right? The people who came before us who did the limit stuff that you all did, did it enough to recognize there's some patterns here. There's some things that are always happening here. And because of that, I can actually shortcut the process and use the patterns and do it that way instead. So this is really good stuff. So we've got some different properties or theorems that are showing up from somebody else's work in 2.1, okay? So we're not gonna spend our life in 2.1 because somebody else did, really. All right, so the first one is the constant rule. If you have a constant, right? A constant looks like a line that looks like a horizontal line. What's the slope of a horizontal line? It's zero. Therefore, the derivative is zero. Because remember, derivatives are slopes. Lines. If you have the slope of a line, you automatically know its slope as well, right? Because it's part of the equation. So the line rule, um, it's not written in here, but I'll write it in here because it kind of comes out of order, is if you had mx plus b, then the derivative, namely the slope, would just be m, right? Okay. Power rule. I think the power rule is the only thing my husband remembers from calculus. He took calculus a very long time ago, but it's memorable for some reason. So when you have x to the n, the derivative is nx to the n minus 1. So you bring the, co the, co the uh, exponent down in front, make it a constant multiplier, and you decrease the power by 1. And the cool thing is that it works for all the values of n. So it doesn't matter if it's a fraction or a decimal. You could have pi as the exponent, and it would still work. Okay? It always is going to work for our values of n. So that's, that's pretty cool stuff. All right, our last one on this slide, this slide is the constant multiplier rule. So the constant multiplier rule simply says if you have a constant that's multiplied by your function, you can just take the derivative and you can just then multiply it by the constant. It doesn't get in the way of anything. It's kind of like when we did those limit rules. Constant multipliers just come along for the ride. They work with limits and they work here because remember the underpinning here is limits. Limits are what's forming the basis of what we're doing. We get to build on that. Sum and difference. Sum and difference is another one that's really easy to work with. It's exactly what you would expect, just like with limits, because limits are what's behind this. If you have f of x equals g of x plus h of x, or minus, you just take the derivative of each one of them individually, g prime of x, h prime of x, like this, and then you add or subtract them together. Everything you want to be true works in section 2.2. And you might have just heard me very clearly say in section 2.2, right? Because we're going to find out that things don't work quite like we would expect later on. But they do for today. All right, our next ones are sine and cosine. The derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Okay? Now we need some examples. So, x to the seventh. What would the derivative of x to the seventh be? 7x to the sixth. 7x to the sixth. No limits, no H's, right? This is good news. Agreed? Quick stuff. All right. How about number two? F prime of T. Well, there's a pi at the beginning, but pi is just a constant multiplier. So it just comes along for the ride. We just bring him along. What's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Now, 
I need to be a little careful. I don't want to put pi minus cosine because that looks like subtraction. So I'd like to put the negative in front of the constant multiplier like this. Uh, another option is that you could put this in parentheses and then move it if you didn't see it right away. But you can't leave it looking like a subtraction, okay? So this is where we end up. Okay, now, these were nice. They looked just like the rules. They don't all start out looking so friendly. So if you have something like this, and there's some in your web assign where they create a table for you and they, they do it in this sort of long drawn out process. Um, but even if they hadn't created a table for you, you can't take this and just jump into the rules that I gave you because it doesn't look exactly like the rules. We need to change it so that it does actually mirror one of the rules that we looked at before. So here's what we do. First of all, uh, that's not what I meant, that's what I meant. First of all, you do not get to move numbers around at, at will. They're staying there. The four and the three don't go anywhere. Four is in the numerator, three is in the denominator. They do not move. So I'm going to leave this as four over three. Okay? However, x squared in the denominator is able to use the properties of exponents. You're telling me what to do. Tell me what I'm going to do. It's x to the negative two. Yes, it's x to the negative two. So properties from um, algebra for exponents apply. If it's in the denominator, you can move it up. Just make the exponent the opposite sign. If it's in this form, this actually looks like the properties we had before. Remember I told you that the constant, not the constant, uh, the power rule works no matter what the exponent sign or like whatever it looks like. So I've got a negative two exponent. Okay, I can do that, that's not a problem. So as I go over here to differentiate, that means take the derivative, I'm gonna take it in steps. So this is 4 third, constant multipliers come along for the ride. And then I multiply and I take the exponent and I move it down. So what is the exponent? Negative two, so I'm gonna multiply by negative two. And then what am I gonna to do to my exponent? I'm going to subtract one. Be careful, this is, these are negatives. I have negative two minus one. That's negative three. Okay, now here's what I'm gonna tell you, it's kinda of cool. Um, next Monday, week from today, you're gonna to be doing a, a, a gateway quiz in class. On the gateway quiz, you can stop right here. You don't have to simplify anything at all on a gateway quiz for me. You just leave it ugly. In fact, if you simplify it, you simplify it wrong, you will get the problem wrong. So you really wanna leave it ugly. <coughs> for the purposes of what we're doing, homework, quizzes, tests, right? Everything but the gateway. We're going to simplify this because there's no reason to leave it looking ugly. Are you with me? So if the problem started out with a positive exponent in the denominator, it needs to end with positive exponents. If you've got multiplication that can be done, you need to do it. And that's what's happening over here. We're going to clean it up. So I have 4 over 3 times negative 2. Well, that's negative 8 over 3. I have x to the negative third that will now join the three in the denominator as x cubed. Okay, yes? To here? Yeah. On the test itself? Yes. If When we have our test on this in a couple of weeks, yes. You will fully, completely simplify everything. The only time we won't is on the gateway when we do that. So what we try to do on the gateway is we try to minimize places where you could make mistakes that aren't truly calculus mistakes. The point of the gateway is getting at the under, you know, the undercurrent of like what calculus is doing. So we want to minimize anything that would cause other problems. And that's the reason. All right. Now, this problem. It didn't look like the same ones it did before. Once again, uh, it looks like I've got division. And in fact, when we get to section 2.3, we will learn something called a quotient rule. And we could do that on this problem, but we don't need it. So what do we do? Well, we're going to use a property of fractions that you probably haven't thought about in a while. 
having all of this in the numerator divided by the x squared means I could have had each of the individual pieces divided by x squared. So I can change this, and I can write this as x cubed over x squared minus 3x squared over x squared plus 4 over x squared. And every piece of that simplifies to something that we could use. How can I rewrite x cubed over x squared? That's x. How about negative 3x squared over x squared? Negative 3. And then the 4 over x squared looks like the last problem I did. What would I do? Plus 4x to the negative 2. So there are cases, and this will be true on the gateway too, where you need to do a little simplification before you get started. It'll make life easier if you do. Sometimes it will make life possible. I mean, right now, you know nothing else to do. There are no other choices. This is a requirement to do this problem right now. So we're ready to do derivative. Okay, so what's the derivative of x? Why is it 1? x is linear. This is the one that I wrote in over here at the bottom, right there. I've got an equation right here that's just 1x plus nothing. It's linear. So the, the slope of a linear equation is simply the number that's running to x, and in this case it's a, it's a 1. How about the slope of the negative 3? That's zero. I'm going to put it in for the moment just so that you remember it later and you're like, not like, where did that thing go? It became zero. Its derivative is zero. How do I do the derivative of 4x to the negative 2? Power rule and constant multiplier rule. Okay, so the 4 is going to stay put, but you probably don't really need to write the 4 again to do this. Because what's, what's the negative 2 going to do? It's going to come down and get multiplied by the 4. And I think we could probably do that in one step. So I can simply do that all at the same time, and I can get negative 8. x to what power? To the negative third. Gateway, you end right there. You don't go any further. But for everything else, we will. So here's a 1. I don't really need to keep writing the plus 0, so I'm not going to do that. And then I have a negative 8 and the x cubed will go back to the denominator. Okay. Radicals. You knew it was coming, right? Two radicals in section 2-1. I need to know what to do in section 2-2. You'll like it. Or at least you'll like it better <laughs> than you did before. Okay. When we have radicals, there is a way to write radicals with rational exponents. Again, it happens in algebra, but again, you may not have seen it recently, so let me remind you. If you have the mth root of x to the n, this is rewritten as x to the n over m. So whatever is underneath the radical is the numerator of the fraction. Whatever the index of the radical is, is the denominator of the fractional exponent. So in order to do this problem, we first need to get it into a form that's usable. And right now, that means powers, right? And in fact, on these, it will always mean powers. There won't be another option. So what's the exponent on the x right now that's underneath the radical? It's a 1, so it becomes a 1 third. What will the fifth root of x become? to the one-fifth, right? So this is a rewriting step. It's exactly the thing I started with, just in a different form. And then I need to take the derivative. So, right, I told you we could do it with fractions, and now we are. I have a one-third fraction. So I'm gonna take my one-third fraction and I'm gonna bring it to the front. So I'm gonna do something that looks kind of funny for some of you, but for others of you, you're gonna be like, oh, that was really helpful. So just, you know, pretend if you don't like it, just pretend like you don't care at the moment anyway. We're doing one-third minus one. Literally what we're going to do. And then we're going to do the same thing for the one-fifth. We're going to bring one-fifth down. And we're going to do one-fifth minus one. 
And on the gateway, you can leave it like that. Some of you are like, cool, I don't really like doing, dealing with fractions. I will leave it that way. You're not gonna leave it that way on anything else you're gonna turn in for me, right? I mean, the reality is you've dealt with fractions a lot. We should be able to subtract them, right? And so we're gonna subtract them. What is one third minus one? Yep, it's negative two thirds. What is one fifth minus one? <coughs> negative four fifths. Okay, now I don't know that that's really any better. Uh, I mean, it's, it is somewhat more simplified, but it's still really messy. Um, the exponents are negative and they're fractions. How do we deal with the negative? We move them down, right? We're gonna move them down. How do we deal with the fractions? We switch them back into radicals, which is how we changed them to begin with. So we're gonna do it in two steps. Again, I don't have to see it in two steps, but just wanna take it a little bit slow if you haven't seen some of the algebra in a while. The first thing is we're gonna move this back down like that. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite it. So the value that's on the bottom of the fraction, the three will become the index of the radical. So we're going to get a cube root and the value that's in the numerator, the two, stays as a power on the x. So this is the cube root of x squared. And then on the other one, it will be a fifth root of x to the fourth. Okay, so I am gonna pause, we're out of time, and I'm gonna record the last three. I know you're like three or four, whatever, that's a lot of problems. They're easy derivatives, but they do one step further. Remember in section 2.1 how we were plugging numbers in or then we were creating lines? That's what those, the, the rest of these problems are tending toward, okay? So I'm gonna push pause, and I'm gonna let y'all go, and then I'm gonna finish recording it. So when you go and you look for this recording, it's gonna just be this recording from class, and I will actually send you a message inside of Canvas that tells you how much is left of the video so that you can find the appropriate spot to go back to without having to search too far, okay? All right, so I'm gonna pick up where I left off in class today with a couple more examples here. Um, on number six, we're going to be finding the slope of the graph at a particular point, and then we're gonna be confirming it with a graphing utility. So hopefully I can walk through this enough that you can verbally follow the graphing utility part because it's a pretty cool feature. So we have this equation, y equals three x cubed minus 10. Um, as I mentioned before, some of these are gonna be a lot easier derivatives to find. So we've got the constant multiplier rule means the three in the front is gonna come along for the right, and the power rule, the three at the ex exponent is gonna come down. So we're going to get 3 times 3 is 9, and decrease the exponent by 1 is going to be a 2. And then the derivative of the negative 10 is 0. Okay? So this is my derivative. That's the easy part. And then what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate it. I'm going to put it in like this at the point, oops, sorry, at the point 2. So y prime of 2 means I have 9 times 2 squared. Um, remember, order of operations, I'm going to square first. So 2 squared is 4. 4 times 9 would be 36. So our slope is actually 36. That's what we're asked to find. Confirming it with a calculator. So um, I'd like for you to look at your calculator. There's a button that says math. We used it today in class. If you hit math, okay, so the first thing you do is you hit the math button. And the second thing you do is you arrow over until you find, or down, arrow down, excuse me, until you find n deriv. So it's option eight. So underneath it, there's an an option eight that says in deriv. Now, depending on your operating system, I'm gonna show you what mine looks like first. I'm gonna select that, just press enter on it, and it's gonna show up in your regular screen. So mine actually shows up in my regular screen as in deriv. The notation is that it wants me to first put in the equation. So you can either write the equation in, like the actual equation, not the derivative we just found, but the actual equation you were given. You can either write it in here, or you can go into y equals, which I would prefer, and to write it in there. So if in y equals, you can write in 3x cubed minus 10, okay? 
And then back in your regular screen where you had the end derivative, you can tell it that you want y1. Now where do you find y1? Well, you find y1 by hitting vars and then arrowing over to the one that says y vars. And then you're gonna select function. It's the number one prompt underneath here. It's function. You press enter. And then you select the prompt underneath that that's y1. Okay, so that's the series of steps. Uh, and then you put comma x, comma, and then the value you're trying to find it at. So in this case, it's a two. So if you press all those things, y1, comma x, comma two, it will take the equation for you and it will find the value. Oh, I have a typo in mind. Let me just fix that. Okay, there it was. Um, now, it's probably worth noting that, like, in my calculator right now, it says 36.000003. Uh, your calculator is not using calculus. Uh, it is using a numerical estimation, so it actually is less accurate than you are, but it's still telling you that it's it's about 36 from its numerical processing, so you've got the right answer. Um, the other option, I believe, um, looks a little bit different. Like, it doesn't say end deriv, but you still end up putting these values in the corresponding spots. Um, because I don't have a calculator with me that has that operating system, um, you'll have to be able to take a look at it yourself and see those things, but I think it's pretty obvious about what you're doing on that. Okay, so let's look at number seven. Number seven, same directions. I'm supposed to find the slope at a particular point and then confirm with a calculator. So I've got the derivative of the value where theta is my variable. So the derivative of sine is cosine. The constant multiplier of four comes along for the ride. So this is four cosine of theta minus. And then the derivative of theta. So theta, remember, is just the variable. It's acting just like the x we had before. So the derivative of x, in this case, would have been one, so the derivative of theta is also one. And then we're going to plug in the number zero. So we have four cosine of zero minus one. Unit circle says that the cosine of zero is equal to one. So this is four times one minus one or three, okay? Now, in your calculator, you can do the end deriv. You can change your equation in y1 to say the original four sine theta, or you can type it in as four sine x minus x. And then you can do y1 comma x comma zero, and it will again spit out for you three. There's one thing to note that could happen and depending on what your calculator is set up at right now, it could be the case because we haven't looked at it together. In mode, you need to be in radian mode. And you'll need to do that for everything we do this semester. So if you're still in degree mode from a trick class, please change that. Okay, next one we're going to do is actually doing the same thing we were before, but now we're going to actually find the tangent line. So we take a derivative y prime equals, so power rule 4x cubed minus power and constant multiplier rule. I multiply the 3 by the 2 exponent, give me a 6. Decrease my exponent by 1, so 2 to 1 gives me just x, and then the derivative of 2 is 0. And I'm going to evaluate it at the ordered pair point they give me, so I'm evaluating it at 2. So y prime of 2 means I'm going to put a 2 in for all my x's. So I have two cubed is eight, eight times four is 32, minus two times six is going to be 12. This gives me a slope of 20. I create my tangent line by doing y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. y1 is six, the slope m we just found is 20, x1 is two. So I have y minus 6 equals 20 times x minus 2. So y minus 6 I'll distribute through is 20x minus 40. And we will add the 6 to it. And this is y equals 20x and then minus 34. Okay, so part B here has this graph it with a 
calculator, right, to confirm that these actually work for part B. Um, so let's take a look at that real quick. So put the original equation, x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 2 in y1. Put your derivative equation in y2. Um, not the derivative equation, your, your tangent equation, so the 20x minus 34. Um, this is a really tight graph. It's very narrow. Um, so when you hit zoom six, it's gonna look very, very narrow. I'm gonna actually change my window to go, let's say maybe like from negative five to five on the X only. I'll leave the Y alone um, and see if that helps. And I think that it does help some. Um, I don't think I can see my 0.26, so I actually may need to adjust that too, just a second. All right, I made my adjustments. Uh, so the original graph looks like a W kind of looks like, oops, it kind of looks like the one we saw earlier today with the absolute value, but it's smooth. It's actually bouncing off of there, not um, flipping back up. So it looks something like this. And then again, it's not drawn to scale, but over here somewhere is about a two. And uh, this is my point. My graph is definitely not drawn to scale. But there's a point here at two. And then the tangent line that I'm getting right here is a very steep tangent line. It looks something like that, and it's crossing really low at negative 34. Okay, our last one. This last one talks about horizontal tangent lines, and I mentioned that we were going to um, talk about vertical tangent lines later, but we haven't talked about this one at all. So derivative first, right, s prime of x. Okay, so the three as the exponent comes down, and so I'm gonna end up getting the two thirds. I'll write this actually out times the 3x squared, and then I have minus, I have my 1 half times 2x, and then I have minus 3, and the derivative of the 27 is 0. Um, I just wrote this out because I wanted you to see that the 3s are canceling here, and so are the 2s. So I end up with no fractions in the end here. I have 2x squared minus x minus 3. All right, so a horizontal tangent line, a horizontal line means that it has a slope of zero. Right, horizontal line looks like this. There's no slope, or there's a zero slope is more accurate to say, zero slope. So when it's asking you for a horizontal tangent line, it's literally asking you to set your equation equal to zero. So the slope is zero. In order to find out where this happens, we would be down to factoring because this one is actually a quadratic. If it were a linear equation, we wouldn't need to necessarily factor. And we would get here as we factor 2x minus 3 and x plus 1. We set each piece equal to 0. The first one gives me x equals 3 halves. The second one gives me x equal to negative 1. Okay? Now, this asks us for the points, not just the x values. Points mean ordered pairs, and this ordered pair is not these two x values stuck together. The ordered pair is the value three halves something, and then negative one something. And what I encourage you to do then is to put them back into your calculator and to get it in a fractional form, because otherwise you're gonna get some repeating decimals at least on part of them. So on the first one, you'll end up getting 189 over 8. That does have a decimal form that's acceptable, right? It would be 1.5 and then 23.625. The other one with the negative one is 173 over 6. The problem is that this is actually a repeating decimal. It's 28.83 repeating, which means we would not want it to be written in that form, right? This would not be advisable at all because it has a repeating decimal form. So on this one, I would be tempted just to leave them both in fractional form, although if you wanted to use the decimal form, you could.